Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's AMR discussion webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. This webinar series is, uh, is the webinar series by GARD Scientific Affairs team to complement our Revive webinar series, which focuses on more technical aspects of antimicrobial R&D. The AMR discussions aim to provide a platform for discussions of various topics related to AMR. Before we get started, a few little housekeeping information. Today's webinar will be recorded and you will find the video in next week on our website under revive.gardp.org slash AMR discussions. Or you can also go on our general webinar page, revive.gardp.org slash webinars where you can find the Revive webinar recordings, GARDP webinar recordings, as well as the AMR discussions. The last few minutes of today's webinar will be reserved for audience questions. And for this, we invite you to send your questions in the questions window of the webinar control panel early in the webinar. And please also include the name of the speaker your question is addressed to. And we will do our best to address as many questions as possible at the end. Today's topic is market interventions to improve access to antibiotics for resistant infections. For this, we're excited to welcome a great panel with Brenda Waining from the Global Drug Facility, Wesley Kraft from iPlus Solutions, Hema Srinivasan from MedAccess and Kim Four, who leads the secure project at GARDP. Our moderator today is Murphy Mpundu. Murfin is a public health specialist, director of REACT Africa, and the partnership and engagement lead for the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, ICARS. He has over 25 years of experience in international global health and security. He has successfully supported several countries, countries with the development, implementation, and reviewing of their AMR national action plans. His expertise includes global health security, health system strengthening, pooled procurement, health policy, implementation research, and country assessment in healthcare and pharmaceutical R&D. He is a strong advocate for action on AMR and equitable access to healthcare for all, and also a strong voice for low and middle income countries at the global level on AMR. Welcome, Murfin. I now invite you to switch on your webcam and uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Astrid, for um, that kind introduction. It is, um, it is an honor for me, and I'm sure it is an honor for my other colleagues that uh, will be on this, on this panel. Um, I, I think I should start by really saying really good afternoon to everyone, and welcome again to our crucial discussion on market interventions to improve access to antibiotics for resistant infections. Access to appropriate antibiotic treatment is not a luxury, it's a lifeline. In the face, um, in the face of a growing burden of AMR, the importance of having the right antibiotic at the right time cannot be emphasized enough. Access to effective antibiotics is the cornerstone of a functioning health system and a mainstay for responding to emerging health threats and achieving universal health care. However, we find ourselves navigating a challenging paradox. On one hand, the pipeline for new antibacterial drugs remains uh, worryingly insufficient to consider AMR. On the other hand, even when these drugs are successfully developed, um, Real accessibility remains an overarching uh, challenge, especially in low and middle income countries. To underscore the gravity of this situation, a study revealed that only 12 of the 25 new antibiotics launched between 1999 and uh, 2014 were registered in more than 10 countries. This when coupled with the fact that many antibiotics tailored to treat drug-resistant infections encounter small, fragmented, and unpredictable uh, markets. Navigating these small, yet growing markets uh, uh, necessitates a meticulous approach 
one that harmonizes supply with demand, uh, promoting sustainable and affordable access, and crucially, incentivizes the judicious use of these invaluable drugs. Market interventions uh, such as coordinated procurement and the strategic stockpiling image as potential avenues to achieve uh, these goals. Uh, today, we are fortunate to have a panel of, es uh, um, of esteemed experts in market shaping who share from their experiences. Through their insights, we will not only explore the successful and learnings of market shaping interventions in other areas, but also discern how these strategies can apply um, to the realm of AMR. Our collective aim is to uh, clear, to brainstorm, discuss, and ultimately chart a push, uh, um, chart a path uh, towards ensuring equitable and sustainable access, reliable, and uh, molecules that are affordable to every human being under the sun. Uh, some of the barriers that we may be able to talk around are going to be around the issues of evidence, uh, uh, the uh, market itself, uh, issues of supply, issues of registration, and we uh, will touch on the issues of distribution and also plans. With that introduction, I would like to um, introduce um, our panel. Uh, we've got uh, Brenda Wenning, uh, who is the chief of Stop TB's global drug facility. It's a UN hosted enterprise with a mission to improve access to TB products through market shaping procurement, innovative delivery systems, and technical assistance. She has been active in the field of access to medicines for over 25 years in academic donor and implementer roles focusing on intersection of uh, 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 policy and pharmaceutical uh, uh, market shaping and the next uh, uh, presenter is Wesley uh, uh, Kreff, who is joining our panel. Uh, and uh, um, Wesley ha uh, has over 20 years of professional experience in procurement and supply management. Uh, he specializes in project management, supply chain management, logistics, uh, strategic sourcing, and contracting. Through his work at iPlus uh, uh, Solution, Wesley has gained a deep understanding of public health supply chains, uh, tendering procedures, tender adjudic uh, adjudication, uh, procurement strategies, principles, and techniques and practices. And having had worked with the Global Fund before and the USID, uh, United Governments, he is familiar with international procurement uh, uh, guidelines as recommended. Welcome, Wesley. Uh, Hema uh, um, is a seasoned global health leader and expert in shaping health markets to improve patient access. Most recently, Hema served as the chief access officer of Med Access, where she built and led a team of experts to envision and implement innovative financing partnerships uh, with the aim of expanding access to health products and services in under deserved communities. And we have Kim Fur, who uh, is from South Africa and has worked within, uh, uh, within actually South Africa for over 20 years, both in public and in the private sector, and also in mining. So she understands uh, the various challenges organizations experience whilst planning to provide quality health services. Her roles have included quality assurance, continuous improvement work, uh, 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 targeting patient safety and infection control. I also had the privilege of working with Kim when we supported Zimbabwe to develop uh, their national action plan between 2015 and 2017. So panelists, you are very welcome. And uh, we hope that we will have, uh, uh, you know, a meaningful and productive uh, um, conversations. And um, without um, really much ado, let's get going. Uh, so I'm going to pause. This is a question that, uh, you know, we 
you know, um, I'm going to pause to um, each one of you and uh, uh, I would like you to weigh in. Um, so what lessons are from market shaping in other disease areas can be applied to AMR and where do we need different approaches? We'll start with you, Ken. Hi, Mervyn, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you on stage again and with all my esteemed colleagues as well. So I'm going to talk in the context of how secure a project within God P and an initiative that's in partnership with WHO is looking at improving market access to um, essential antibiotics for low and middle income countries. And I'm specifically going to focus on our procurement and economic interventions that we've recently done an analysis on to try and identify how we can create market efficiencies and predictability, for example, by aggregating antibiotic demand across multiple countries through pool procurement or coordinated procurement mechanisms. We're also trying to um, improve our ability to optimize pricing and the availability for countries of these new products by creating more attractive markets for the suppliers, but then also ensuring that we have affordability mechanisms for the countries um, and in the same time making sure that we don't forget the whole appropriateness of, of treatment and, and stewardship as well. So in that process we have looked at various um, economic and procurement tools. We have modeled these in different scenarios for low middle income countries to identify the most feasible solutions. And we'll be publishing this information very soon on our website um, and in our God Key newsletter as well. We've looked at purchasing options such as coordinated procurement, um, ranging from pool procurement to pool procurement um, and forecasting, looking at supply diversity through multiple supplier selection, We've looked at developing regional or international stockpiles of antibiotics to address the issues around shortages and surety of supply. We've examined different um, supplier guarantees, including revenue or volume guarantees to see which is the most feasible and appropriate for the different types of antibiotics we're looking in our portfolio. We've also looked at how do we help countries to bring these products into their portfolios and in the EMLs when they haven't had them before. Um, and part of that is looking at time limited catalytic subsidy payments for these products that will help the country make it more affordable, but also potentially help them reduce the entry barriers by supporting registration mechanisms, um, stewardship mechanism and introduction strategies for the countries. Um, and finally, we've also looked at how do we bring new products into markets without disrupting the mechanism of, of a stewardship and ensuring appropriate, um, um, appropriate use by creating a portfolio of antibiotics that encourages the use of the most appropriate second line treatment before you use the last line treatment as well. So we'll be happy to share those documents as soon as they are ready um, on our website as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Kim, for that. And of course, uh, it's uh, um, it's one of you know uh, um, one of the areas that you touched on really has to be you know how do we bring in uh, new molecules um, into um, into countries, uh, high income countries, low um, and uh, medium income countries. Of course, we know. Uh, uh, that currently the models that we have around uh, uh, legislation, sometimes it takes over two years to actually have the molecule in the African market where I uh, have spent a lot of uh, uh, many years uh, uh, working. But I'll go to Wesley and, uh, you know, um, Wesley, um, I'll start by saying that, you know, the, um, we have um, a situation where, you know, we, we treat uh, uh, children as little adults and um, you know in the scope of uh, the lessons that you've learned from uh, market shaping in other areas uh, uh, how can we apply that to you know to um, you know to bring in uh, new innovative approaches uh, that addresses uh, um, not just uh, adult formulations but also um, has uh, uh, really a particular uh, emphasis on uh, uh, on children yeah 
Thank you very much, Marvin. Um, yeah, I think the example I can I can best think of is the um, is the one on the the pediatric HIV products, where let's say about ten years ago um, we had quite a, a strange market. There were over sixty different formulations being used across the portfolios. The WHO guidelines were quite broad. Um, and actually, all the suppliers were confronted with very small orders from individual countries that, yeah, they basically couldn't have a commercial model to, to commercialize and produce those in, in scale. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing um, together with a number of, of the, the donor organizations like, like Pepfar and the Global Fund and Unidate is um, setting up this, this ARV procurement working group, um, which didn't really have to roll, a role to pull the procurement as to, to Kim's point. That is a solution and each individual program had their own pool procurement mechanism, but purely to make sure that the, the demand information was um, aggregated and shared with the suppliers on one end. And the second most important is how could we um, optimize the, the number of products that were being used and being ordered. So we worked very closely with the World Health Organization on an optimary, optimally formulary list, reducing it to about 15 different formulations. Um, but I think the main role, and I think that's where um, the AMR market dynamics can also play a big role, is how do you make sure that information on supply availability and demand aggregation is actually brought together and there's um, yeah, less, less storytelling or I heard from that person that that supplier is not able to deliver. So that's why we've ordered a different product. I think we've, we had seen that a lot where actually when you engage with the suppliers, they're very eager to um, make it a success, but they need some level of uh, assurance that there's gonna be a market for products. Um, one very um, specific thing we did is informing all the countries and there were over 100 countries that participated um, there are four timelines in the year where you should get your order or your intended order in with that information we could actually go to the suppliers and tell them there's three four five batches coming up so please get ready and make sure that you're ready to produce um, the promise to the countries was if they were able to meet that deadline, they also got their products within the next two or three months because we already kind of pre print some of these productions. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the combination of trying to aggregate demand and having that voice to the suppliers, but also in case there's supply disruption, uh, disruptions, having a fair share towards each of the countries to prevent that one country is just buying all the available stock and the other countries are left with nothing. I think that was the main role in terms of the, the working group. And I think that's where yeah, some market interventions on, on AMR can also benefit from. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And we, uh, we will uh, uh, delve into that uh, uh, a little uh, uh, deep. I remember uh, uh, just a few years ago, I mean, when I was leading a food procurement and we visited uh, uh, manufacturing industries in uh, uh, India, uh, Malaysia, and I mean, it was unbelievable how small um, the African orders were, even if you aggregated them compared to what the high income countries were going to, you know, uh, would be able to, uh, um, to procure. And of course, it means that you cannot be prioritized in such a setting. But I also like to have, uh, you know, uh, pay my way in on this, uh, you know, again, looking at the lessons, um, you know, that we've learned around market shaping and uh, uh, trying to focus more um, you know at country level and uh, uh, giving us one or two examples uh, around that sure happy to Marvin and I think this very much builds on some of the comments Kim Wesley and, and you have been making so yeah the lesson I would highlight really is the criticality of what I call demand side engagement so continuous engagement with governments, providers, procurers, civil society in both the design and the implementation of successful market shaping programs. You know, I read a lot of case studies on market shaping literature, and I find that we do a really good job of very clearly describing supply side interventions, but we often fail to capture both the importance and the nuance of complementary demand side market shaping work. 
Just to share a quick example to highlight this, last year, MedAccess announced a market shaping partnership for HIV self-tests. Mm -hmm. Now, the supply side intervention was pretty simple to describe, it involved a volume guarantee over multiple years to a company called Wandfo, and that in turn secured a $1 ceiling price mm -hmm. for a WHO pre-qualified HIV self-test. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who aren't aware, this was a price that the HIV community had been targeting for many, many years. There were lots of great analyses, market reports, basically showing that at a $1 price point, we could cost effectively introduce HIV self-testing as a screening tool in health facilities. This in turn would save the health system significant money, it would improve the yield and the reach of HIV testing programs, and it would save health workers a lot of time. So on paper, we've achieved this $1 price point with just this supply side intervention. And we should see maybe a 5X, 10X increase in total mm. usage of HIV self-tests. Yeah. But as we all know, in reality, scale-up is a lot more complicated than that when you're looking at you know, tens, maybe hundreds of different countries. So yeah. we took out several months to talk to government representatives within ministries of health to engage technical working groups on the ground, groups like PEPFAR country teams, Global Fund, CHAI, PSI, um, who had all spent years kind of building and shaping this market for HIV self-tests. Mm. And we learned a lot of really interesting things. I think at the highest level, you know, countries were on a pretty wide spectrum in terms of introduction of self-testing. There were some that had spent years and years already introducing self-tests in facilities, had worked with lots of different types of tests. So all that you really needed to scale this up was a product registration and some validation studies at this new, more affordable price point. At the other end of the spectrum, we had countries who had never introduced self-testing in facilities, had only had one type of self-test in the past. So you're probably going to need years of health worker trainings, feasibility yeah. studies um, at the national, but also subnational settings, and um, quite a lot of maybe cost effectiveness analysis, guidelines, changes, that sort of thing. So that could take years and years, and at the moment wasn't really planned. Yeah. These types of insights were really important for us in designing a truly comprehensive market shaping intervention and one that would have impact in the long run, not just in the short run. So we made a number of changes to the design of this partnership on the basis of those insights and that feedback. So one, we decided to fund a partner that was working in multiple target countries to support that guidelines updating process, product evaluations, training, supply planning, all of these activities. We also went back to the supplier and we asked them to commit to supporting product evaluations and trainings because we knew this was going to be a big undertaking for governments. We also, another kind of interesting insight we had learned was there are significant markups on self-tests throughout the supply chain. And so we went back to the supplier and said, actually, the $1 X factory price isn't quite good enough. We're going to yeah. need you to make commitments in terms of end purchaser pricing and work with your distributors to really make sure that there's follow through on that. So I think at a high level, that just helps to illustrate how this kind of parallel demand and supply side engagement is really mm -hmm. important in designing effective market shaping partnerships. And in my view, that's a lesson we should kind of take with us as we consider how market interventions could be helpful yeah. in addressing AMR. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Emma. You know, there is uh, um, uh, certainly uh, a lot of a lot of conversations. Uh, um, some of you have participated in them. I have participated in those. You know, looking at the at the pull and push uh, 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 mechanisms and interventions to you know um, be able to um, you know address the issues of access. And you know, and as we know, you know, there there are actually more people that die from lack of access uh, than access itself. And I think it brings in uh, uh, Brenda here at the right time. Uh, uh, food procurement has been uh, discussed uh, um, as a strategy to improve antibiotic access. Given the experience of uh, GDF's extensive experience and success with food procurement and market shipping for TB, uh, I'm wondering uh, if you could speak um, about how this model uh, can benefit access to other antibiotics uh, that are not only on the market, but those that might come on the market. The danger is, and I think the danger for me is that, um, you know, we 
yes, we do need new innovation of new drugs, but I think having a new antibiotic now, uh, you know, it will it will face the same fate, if you know, of losing uh, uh, its potency if we, um, you know, if we don't put in uh, uh, mechanisms uh, that actually protect that. So you know, uh, uh, Brenda, you know, uh, uh, your reflections are uh, uh, from your experience. We just lost you. There we go. Have to press the right button. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Much for your opinion, and uh, uh, thanks, Guard P, for the um, for the invitation to participate uh, today. Um, so maybe I'll just keep it, you know, the answer to this question um, maybe a bit broader from uh, mm. experience I've had across many diseases, and then on the next round, maybe I'll get into the specifics about sort of what we've learned from GDF and, and TB. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, when I got into this business a long time ago, uh, market shaping was new. That was over 20 years ago. Huh? Now we have 20 plus years of experience with market shaping. Mm. Now, arguably, a lot of that is um, in the large donor funded programs. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. Uh, and I think the knee jerk reaction is to say, oh, no, 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 AMR is different. We can't apply anything from those models into here because it's you know, going to be self-financed. We're not going to have a global fund for AMR, et cetera. So I think it's, it is true that on the financing side, you need a, you're going to need a, a completely different approach uh, to be sure. That said, I think it would be a shame to just write off all the lessons learned we've had from these massive investments in market shaping for access because you don't need to copy paste the whole the whole approach you can look and pick and choose what fits for amr from other diseases even if they're donor funded adapt as needed etc and i think um definitely in terms of approach what's hmm. consistent across all the diseases is first and foremost it definitely takes a village to manage a market there's no one entity that can do it Everybody has to play and you need everybody around the table. And that's really critical. You need some type of coordinating mechanism, something like a secure that can convene and bring the key stakeholders um, to the table. Um, and as Hema said, you have to work on both the supply and demand side and the interactions between the two. Often you, the, the interventions focus specifically on supply or specifically on demand, but it's all connected. So having some mechanism that can work end to end across the product life cycle from identifying what's needed, getting suppliers to produce these products, getting them into countries, scaling them up, and then helping to scale out when they're no longer needed, which is equally as difficult and often forgotten. So I think you know those are approaches that regardless, we need to work into um, an AMR uh, approach. Um, and, Obviously, first and foremost, the most important stakeholder in this village is the countries. So this has to be country led. You need champions at the country level. You need countries that, uh, that can come and be part of developing a common agenda and then creating a work plan that really works for both the suppliers and the countries. Every supplier is different in terms of what it takes to get them and keep them in the market. And you need yeah. to understand that every country is different. Some may want a pooled procurement, some may want to do it on their own and they don't need anything except just get the products out there, we'll get them. And some may want some combination of, of both, maybe using the pooled procurement as a safety net, maybe some yeah. technical assistance on how to do the procurement. So I think it's really about, um, you know, people coming together and then analyzing the different markets um, and the different stakeholders in the market to design an approach that fits you know all needs and, and makes it easy for both the suppliers and the countries i think that's what we're going for okay, okay. Uh, um, thank you so much uh, uh, for that response i would like to also encourage participants uh, uh, wherever you are if you've got a question kindly uh, 
post it so that I, you know, uh, we can weigh in on that. Uh, getting back to you, Hema, again, I mean, how can financial instruments like uh, volume or revenue guarantees uh, be used to actually support affordable access uh, to antibiotics, including uh, in low and middle income countries? Uh, do we need, um, you know, new innovative tools? Um, you know, we've We've seen uh, uh, Sweden and uh, you know uh, the UK trying a model um, that uh, uh, incentivizes uh, uh, you know industry uh, by assuring uh, uh, in terms of procurement of the of the products that are coming out. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it builds on a lot of what Wesley and, and Brenda were talking about as well. So I think just taking a step back innovative financing tools like multi-year revenue guarantees, volume guarantees, in my view, are particularly useful in markets that satisfy two criteria. So one, there has to be a clear benefit associated with broad access to a health product. It's kind of essential for donors and, and financing groups to see. And the return on investment to the supplier has to be sort of uncertain or unattractive. Um, in the case of novel antibiotics, I think we satisfy both. So there's clear benefit at the individual level for people who contract drug resistant infections and hopefully at the population level as well um, in terms of preventing the development of further resistance. However, mm -hmm. product suppliers are facing significant uncertainty in terms of the commercial proposition of both developing and launching these products across you know, what we call low and middle income countries, there's a lot of diversity there, right? You're talking about 100 plus countries. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there are a number of reasons for that. As you kind of articulated nicely, Murph, and in the introduction, we see a lot of governments, NGOs, who are really keen to promote antimicrobial stewardship. But procurement of antibiotics, as we all know, is still really highly fragmented. So the decisions around what product is going to be used are influenced by governments, healthcare institutions, providers, pharmacists, distributors, patients, um, and there's really limited regulation or transparency on how those decisions are ultimately made. And in that type of really fragmented, kind of opaque demand side environment, suppliers need to invest a lot of money, not only in making the product, but also mm -hmm. in establishing regulatory, commercial, medical affairs presence in every individual country where they launch. That's a lot of money to spend. And those yeah. are tough commitments to make if you're just not mm -hmm. sure what the sales potential mm -hmm. is of mm -hmm. a novel antibiotic product. Mm -hmm. what we often see is that suppliers at a risk premium to their price to help mm -hmm. cover a lot of those costs. And that can serve to limit uptake in markets that are really price sensitive. And when you're talking about, for example, reserve antibiotics, mm. you're already talking about volumes that are gonna be significantly lower than those of some of the older, more widely used antibiotics that have been kind of optimized in costs over many, many decades. So if you add a risk premium onto that, you're talking about potentially a significantly more expensive product that's just gonna be hard to sell. So in those kinds of scenarios, you can bring in financing groups like MedAccess, the Gates Foundation, CEDA, others, to try to de-risk that supplier's investment in developing and commercializing products across, you know, hopefully hundreds of low and middle income countries. In the past, those have been really successful in securing more affordable prices, um, securing, you know, faster availability of products. I think in the AMR space, what the UK, Sweden have done is, is really innovative. So they're sort of saying, not only do we need to kind of guarantee sales volumes over multiple years, we might just need to guarantee revenues because we might need to actually de-link the volumes from the payout to suppliers because of some of the dynamics here around stewardship where more isn't always better. Um, and a lot of the kind of historic volume guarantees have been predicated yeah. on this idea you know, products can be so beneficial that more is better. In this case, we have to do, uh, I, there's a little bit more nuance to that. Um, but I think building on what Brenda said, you know, market shaping partnerships are always bespoke. They have to be designed for the specific market, the specific barriers to access that we see. There's no one template. And in these highly fragmented markets, I think collaboration is even more critical. So as long as we have everyone at the table, global, regional, country level stakeholders at the right time, 
um, yeah. as we're kind of designing these, I, I think we can be successful in building and shaping these markets. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, build on, building on that, uh, uh, Wesley, can you share some insights on how, uh, you know, uh, broader trends in healthcare, uh, such as value-based care and uh, 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 digital health, uh, can actually help um, improve the market for antibiotics? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And that's actually one we asked ourselves a couple of years back, how can actually the, the different sectors, so the private sector, the faith-based sector, but also the, the broader public sector learn from each other. And um, what we actually realized in terms of supply chain, is that there are quite a lot of um, so-called non-value or limited value at um, middlemen or stakeholders in the supply chain before an a quality product reaches uh, the patient or the ones that needs the product. And in antibiotics, that's very telling. And what does that do? What we actually, uh, we did a, a number of country studies where there are one or two um, wholesalers or distributors with quite some capital. They bought all the products that came in to the country or were produced um, close by the country. And they're actually holding these products until there was a shortage created. And that shortage created two things. One, um, people were trying to find other ways to get the same products. So that led to um, inferior quality products reaching patients and pharmacies, but it also led to significant price increases and margins jumps from, let's say, the, the, the cost to port until the cost from the port to the patient. Um, the good side here is um, we're, we're not the only ones seeing that because there are actually a lot of um, mostly young entrepreneurs that like to have this digital view of how can we digitalize the supply chain so there's more transparency into what is out there which creates competition because mm -hmm. a lot of this was able to uh, was was happening because there was a lack of information so an individual pharmacy in a in a village or in a town wasn't aware about the actual prices um, other parts of the world or other uh, countries in the regions were paying for that same medicine so it was seen as oh this is this seems to be the price and it's normal that i buy from you know the, the local local counterpart here and then it goes on so actually we see a lot of these digital startups that say we would like to get a product whether it's produced in the country or in the region and that would it's still the preference but even if it's an international product we want to be transparent about what products are out there and what would be the cost to patients and yeah. have that yeah overview so i think that's where we see um a huge jump in the digital so it's it's, yeah. it's what it's the side of digital health which which relates to supply chain how do we have the fair pricing and and include the quality yeah. aspect to it so how can you actually make sure that the products on those platforms have the same yeah the, the right quality standards so yeah. there's not there's a choice about price but also on quality so I yeah. think that's that's what we yeah. are very very optimistic about, and where the antibiotics can can definitely be yeah, extremely yeah. Ben benefit from. Yeah, uh, Kim, there is a question from uh, uh, um, one of the colleagues, uh, um, uh, Georgina Humphreys, who's saying, you know, um, can you describe Secure, its mission, vision, and planned activities? Um, can you weigh in? On, on that. Thank yes, you. Vicky. Thanks, Mervyn. Um, so I think I'm hoping that how we've tried to visualize and and define what SECURE is going to achieve addresses some of what Hima and Wesley and Brenda have mentioned. So as I mentioned before, it's a it's an initiative that is in development with WHO and ourselves got P with the aim to address access to antibiotics for existing and new antibiotics. So we're not just focused on the new antibiotic component. And we're focusing specifically on low and middle income countries, but only on the drugs where there's access challenges. Um, and so we've spent a significant amount of time trying to understand what sort of antibiotic categories there are that have got access challenges and understanding what the access challenges are in each of those categories. So for instance, we've looked at categorizing antibiotics into the AWARE index 
um, which is your access watch and reserve antibiotics as WHO does. And what we're finding is that the challenges with accessing a reserve antibiotic, which is more on the patent side, highly um, expensive, low volume product, is a completely different challenge to your run of the mill antibiotics such as an amoxicillin oral solution, which is an access drug where there's global shortages and, and issues around um, the supply chain of the manufacturing side. So what we're hoping to be able to achieve is this whole idea of working in partnership with countries hmm. to identify in a regional place or a group of countries that are very similar in terms of the access challenge, what are the access challenges, what are the antibiotics that they cannot solve their own access challenges for, and then as everybody has mentioned, look at the supply side, the demand side, and try and see if we can potentially put together a solution, both in terms of aggregating, forecasting demand, maybe just giving antibiotic and supplier market intelligence to help improving procurement decisions that the countries make themselves, helping set up, as I've mentioned before, a coordinated procurement entity, even looking at prioritizing and optimizing the drugs that are on the antibiotic essential medicines list or that are being used in the clinical guidelines for treatment to make sure that they're appropriate for the type of infections, the resistance profile they're seeing. And then if they are choosing a new antibiotic, looking at how you can bring those into the countries in a safe way that the stewardship component is, in, is incorporated. Hmm. So that is what we're hoping to achieve. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, this one, I think uh, uh, Helma will uh, weigh in and the other panelists can also weigh in. Um, it's from um, uh, David Holland who says, you know, with the growing uh, proliferation of uh, substandard and falsified and diverted antimicrobials, uh, including other medicines, um, uh, re causing unnecessary death and mobility across LIMC countries, in brackets and worsening the resistant problem and antibiotics. Is it time to introduce both transnational and national medicines uh, verification and traceability solutions that are actually fit for purpose? I'm thinking particularly of the introduction of the recently launched and the voluntary UNICEF TRBST system that aims to mitigate this problem for governments and patients alike but also improves market access for manufacturers and reduces medicines uh, hesitancy for distrusting patients. I think absolutely it's time. There's been discussion in a lot of different emerging markets for a long time about introducing GS1, you know, barred coding standards, figuring out how to kind of disseminate that at different levels of the supply chain, how to get patients sort of engaged. Um, and I think that has kind of far reaching, potentially very positive consequences, not just in dealing with falsified or substandard medications, but also just sharing product information more accessibly with patients, right? Oftentimes you go to a pharmacy, you get a blister pack, you don't get the full product introduction leaflet, it might be in the wrong language. If we can kind of digitalize that, it becomes a lot more accessible, a lot easier to control and disseminate new information to every level in the health system, right? Provider might need one type of information, a patient might need different information. It gets everyone a little bit more engaged in trying to solve some of these issues. Um, but I think we're still kind of a long way from implementation of those standards in a lot of countries. So sort of starts with regulation, but there's a lot of behavior change that will be involved too. And I'm not entirely sure how we tackle that. There might be other folks on the line, Murph and yourself, maybe Kim that help us sort of figure out how do we get patients and providers a little bit more engaged in trying to solve some of these issues. And I think Brenda will have a good sense too of just how to get suppliers more engaged and forward leaning on this. There are obviously implications, you need to spend more in terms of updating packaging and labeling. If you need to introduce a barcode on every label, it was something um, my previous role at a pharmaceutical company that we struggled with a lot. If we have to introduce yeah. barcodes for every country, that's gonna be a lot of money. How are we gonna do that within the kind of affordability constraints? So we definitely welcome other perspectives from the panel because it, it's a really big question. It's a big issue. And I think, again, we're, we're going to have to tackle it collectively. 
absolutely. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, um, you know, those are, are, are very good, actually, insights. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's um, it's a complex, but unfortunately is that, uh, you know, uh, the falsified market, it's a heavily invested uh, market that, uh, you know, it's not just easy sometimes to pick up the difference. So I think there is a lot of uh, actually post-market surveillance that uh, that is needed, but we also need to have uh, a lot of data that allows for that. Uh, Brenda, I know that, for, you know, for, for you, this is uh, probably not much of a problem because uh, uh, you only procure from uh, uh, WHO pre-qualified uh, uh, manufacturers. Uh, do you see the difference um, even when you hear of uh, really outside of TB uh, uh, this issue of um, uh, really falsified and uh, uh, poor uh, uh, quality of uh, uh, medicines? Yeah, I mean, um, it is true, my friend, that we only procure from GDF um, medicines that are uh, approved by SRA or WHO prequel. That said, um, you know, we do a lot of work across the entire market and we have a lot of in-country work. And so we have lots of experience with challenges with the quality of, of TB medicines out there. I have to remember that the drugs that we're using for TB were developed in the 1950s and 60s. So that market existed everywhere in the world long before the donors came along in 2000 and decided they were going to implement a new quality standard. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, you know, what happened was that, you know, TB used to be uh, funded domestically, small amount, not enough. People bought whatever product was out there. Then we had the, the Global Fund um, initiative that brought everything under donor funding, different quality standard. And now we're going back as countries are assuming responsibility for financing and procurement to, you know, procuring from these products that have been around for 50 plus years. Mm. So we are seeing, um, challenges and it just depends on the country in terms of you know how good their regulatory systems are and I think we're quite um, encouraged by the amazing work that WHO has done in terms of looking at maturity levels and WLAs and all of this because that's a move in the right direction to make sure that the system is strengthened so that the products coming out are better and I think we're all kind of you know rallying behind WHO so that this can grow and mature and be something that can help identify yeah. um, and classify you know the quality yeah. of drugs in a different way and doesn't shut out you know some of the suppliers that can't afford to get into these um these yeah. markets yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh thank you uh, um kim has got an addition go ahead yeah so Murphy, we've just i'm at the Arcuvia conference here in kigali um, which is an amazing country and what is being done here around quality assurance on products is amazing so gs1 did a presentation Emma, and just out of interest the majority of countries that have got the gs1 barcode standards are not in africa so there's quite a lot of work that's been done on the gs1 standards and yes i mean the whole idea of a barcode that helps you track the quality of that product but also allows the patient to know that this is a quality product. What is the product information? What is the AMR related in information? Why are we not putting quality assurance into the hands of the patient? And um, because we don't have regulatory and enforcement capacity in a lot of African countries, for example, um, we've got hundreds of patients and thousands of patients that could be helping with this. If they know what the price is supposed to be, if they know they're getting a quality product, they will choose right. So give patients power. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, the uh, patients have often been uh, uh, left out, and I think, the, the, you know, this is, I think, uh, uh, something that I um, I like that WHO has, uh, you know, um, come out with um, really patient-centeredness, uh, you know, uh, approach, because then, you know, it does include their voice, uh, you know, uh, uh, in such a, a 
decisions. Uh, just a very short question, and I'd like to get a short answer. This is from uh, uh, Jyoti, uh, uh, Josh from ICAS, who says, I mean, how is access uh, to cheap but quality diagnostics uh, being considered, especially in low and middle income countries where inappropriate use uh, due to market factors is already a problem? Any one of you can go for it. Wesley, you, you want to weigh on it or Emma? <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you repeat the question, Murphy? Um, how is access to cheap but quality uh, diagnostics uh, being considered, especially in low and middle income countries, where um, inappropriate use due to market factors is already a problem? If I had to rephrase it, um, you know, um, I think either Kim or Emma, you know, uh, talked about the uh, talked about the issue around uh, um, around uh, you know diagnostic stewardship. They, yeah, one of the major uh, factors is that you know we can't talk about um, you know uh, stewardship uh, uh, in terms of focusing just on uh, on the molecules while we don't have uh, diagnostics that should be able to guide our treatment so so we have a, you know we have a tipping scale and you know where do we draw the balance and this is the challenge that uh, you know most low and middle income countries are uh, you know they don't have um, uh, diagnostics there are no point of care diagnostics and so you know you're going to go empirical treatment but uh, uh, in that way again we are actually creating uh, uh, a problem uh, can you uh, uh, weigh on on that thank you no, no, thank you very much for the addition. I, I, I think it's it's spot on that um, we, we've seen certain uh, programs or markets where indeed the molecules or the pharmaceutical products um, found their way to the patient quicker than actually the diagnostic tools or there were inferior quite diagnostic tools being used, which then led to, okay, um, I assume that this is the indication you have, so go ahead and um, and try this product um, because we have no other way to to test it out. So I think I think it's almost a given. I remember um, a while back there was the same situation in the in the malaria space where the uh, treatment of malaria became much more accessible with the with the ACTs becoming available. Um, it took some time for countries to implement the WHO guidelines to say you should never give an ACT unless there is a rapid malaria test confirming that it's actually malaria. But that came after the fact because all the, the investments, the focus was actually on creating this very well functioning malaria uh, treatment for three days. So yeah, I think we have learned from that. We've seen other ways of working. And I think yeah, we should not do a step back and actually do the same here what diagnostic tools are needed and should be going into a country in parallel and similar amounts of attention and investment should be given to to the diagnostics um, as, as we are all doing for the for the pharmaceutical products okay i think yeah. it's not as simple though because there's multiple diagnostics for antimicrobials and that is where it becomes a bit complicated. So what I've learned from the REACT conference in Africa recently, Murfin, is that simple, sometimes just a simple diagnostic that says whether you have an infection, yes or no, is actually the most powerful. So doing simple things like urine dipsticks to prove that there's an infection means that 80% of the patients are not going to get an antibiotic and that already improves the antibiotic stewardship component without actually having to go through to a full MCNS to understand what the organism is. And then if you are doing going to go to MCNS, then identify the organisms and make sure that you use that to update the treatment protocols that that health center uses. There is very simple stuff we can do. I would love to have diagnostics in a secure portfolio, but I don't know if it's going to be feasible and how complicated it is yet, but it would be ideal. 
Hmm. Yeah, uh, I know we we are running out of uh, uh, time, and uh, uh, God, if you won't allow me to go beyond the time. So I'll just ask uh, um, um, all of you to just uh, wait in, in less than a minute. Um, we are going into uh, 2024. There is a lot of momentum, and the reason is um, uh, AMR is going to be, you know, uh, one of the major, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, topics there. What do you want to see uh, from uh, UNGA 2024 regarding uh, uh, these issues of access, uh, market shaping, and uh, you know, what would you like to see? Uh, uh, you know, um, come out of uh, uh, UNGA 2024 so that it's not a lost opportunity. And I think I'll start with Hema, then Kim, Brenda, then lastly, Wesley, then I'll wrap it up. It's a big question, Murfin. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think what I would love to see is some sort of organization around the concept of stewardship. I mean, it's very high level, it's very theoretical, I think if we have a clearer sense of how stewardship programs will actually be implemented at country level, that's the first step in being able to even characterize a market here and all of the market shaping interventions, all of the communications with suppliers can be optimized on that basis. But we're not quite there yet. It sort of feels like the wild, wild west. It's um, not a market that I can sort of conceptualize in my mind. And I would love to see that first step be taken at the UN high level meeting next year. I would love to see indicators of how we can track and monitor AMR um, being agreed to, global indicators, um, but not just on AMR but on access to, making sure that we improving access at the same time as improving um, our stewardship. Brenda? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a critical year, and this you know high level meeting is a great opportunity. Um, you know, typically what we see is you know goals around um, uh, you know access treatment numbers, it's et cetera. I think you know where market shaping is new to AMR and it's not a coordinated space. I think what we need to come out of that is a plan for how we'll work together to do that and actually implement it. And I would encourage that there's some type of language built into the high level plan, the, the political declaration that addresses that, not just sort of the, the high level results, but then for the market shaping, for however we're gonna you know, address all of these issues, there needs to be something in there that sets things in motion and we need to start. Don't worry about fixing everything. Like Hema said, if you think about AMR, you just go bug-eyed. You, you have to start small, Make a plan, get a coalition of the willing, start with something small and just get moving. Yeah. Wesley? Yeah, I, I can only echo that. I think uh, the commitment on, on coordination and indeed, um, yeah, let's identify a couple of products and test out if uh, pulling procurement works, um, maybe a stockpiling mechanism to just get it rolling and, and have our lessons learned from that. I think that would be a great achievement. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, my, this has been a very engaging conversation to secure re access to medicines in general and to antibiotics in particular, a well functioning supply system that relies on strong organizational and management support, including appropriate infrastructure, is required. Uh, functional supply chain systems can promote public and animal health by increasing program impact, enhancing quality of care, improving cost effectiveness and efficiency. The supply chain of pharmaceutical products uh, rely on several activities, including product selection, as we have uh, you know, uh, discussed, quantification and procurement, and an inventory management, storage and distribution. To ensure that these activities are performed in an effective and efficient manner, logistics management information systems, organization and staffing, budgetary uh, uh, supervision and evaluations are all key components. Working with improvement of the pharmaceutical management can ensure proper access to antibiotics, but it also would create the right preconditions uh, for appropriate use of antibiotics. And finally also is that, uh, you know, whilst uh, um, 
the major drivers in high income countries of AMR is uh, uh, overuse and misuse. Uh, the social determinants of uh, uh, infectious diseases, however, seem to be the leading cause and uh, uh, we need interventions that address those. On behalf of GADP, I would like to say thank you so much uh, to all the participants and thank you panelists for your wisdom. It's been great to engage with you in this conversation. Thank you.